Greetings, everybody, and welcome. I'm Gabriella Safran. I'm the chair of the DLCL, the Division of Literatures, Cultures, and Languages. And I'm very happy to welcome DPL, David Palumbo Lu, um, another sort of well-known acronym in this building. Um, I'm very happy to welcome David to give the first in our series, our occasional series of talks, How I Think About Literature. So this is the first talk, the inaugural talk of this academic year. Um, let me introduce David. David Palumbo Lu is the Louise Hewlett Nixon Professor and Professor of Comparative Literature at Stanford. He is also the Director of the Undergraduate Program in Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity. <coughs> he has so many other administrative uh, posts, but he, uh, he gave me a very short uh, sort of list of things to say about him, so I'm not saying all the other things that he does here. Um, his most recent publication, um, his most recent book is The Deliverance of Others, Reading Literature in a Global Age. He is a contributing editor for the Los Angeles Review of Books, and he also blogs for The Nation, Salon, Boston Review, Truth Out, Open Democracy, and other venues. And this is not on the sheet that David gave me, but let me just say that David is an amazing citizen of the DLCL and the university, and the world, I yeah. think. Um, and, um, and an incredibly, over the last four years, just an incredibly faithful and attentive and sometimes provocative listener to other people's talks in this series. Um, it's, it's just an incredible pleasure for me to, um, to say that today it is his turn to speak and our turn to listen. He will address us on living with inexactitude. Please welcome, please join me in welcoming David Palumbo Lu. Well, well, thank you and Aji. Uh, I was talking to Jose David about uh, the fact that I really admired his talk because the series really gives us a sense of who we are as, as human beings as opposed to just faculty. So I thought I'd start with a, a childhood story. It won't last that long. But you've heard of C.P. Snow and this idea of two cultures. And uh, my parents really emblematized that. My mother was a humanist. Uh, she studied actually under very famous literary critic I.A. Richards when he taught in Beijing, and he brought her to Cambridge uh, to do this thing called Basic English. And at the time, she also got an MA in uh, Romance Languages and did an MA thesis on D.H. Lawrence, which is really hilarious because my mother was the most modest, in fact, prudish Chinese woman you could imagine. <laughs> and then you overlay that with New England Puritanism and she had this really strong aversion to you know, any anatomical references at all, <laughs> let alone female. And when you go to Chinatown, sometimes you'll see these statuettes of female figures reclining on a couch. And my mother explained that, well, when a Chinese woman went to a doctor, she would never point to her own body. She'd bring along one of these figurines and say, well, you know, doctor, I heard here or there. I told her that she wrote a thesis on D.H. Lawrence. So, that's how ridiculous it was. My father, on the other hand, was indeed the doctor. And I calibrate this, this moment in my life at being about age 12, because it must have been the fourth sequential botched science experiment that I did. Uh, I think Zepp and Alvin both know this story. Um, so he took me aside after the fourth failure, and he said, son, do me a favor. Promise me you'll never be a doctor. <laughs> you have the worst sense of scientific precision there could be. <laughs> so the title of my talk today is Living with Inexactitude. Um, and I think the logic behind a lot of this talk about the crisis in the humanities is that ultimately today we insist on value that has to be quantified or measured to be really real. And one of the articles I'm working on is entitled, What is a Unit? It's an abysmal question accreditors ask and that the federal government mandates. <clears throat> to answer the question requires an exercise in what Espeland and Stevens call commensuration. 
This is what they say about commensuration. Commensuration transforms qualities into quantities, difference into magnitude. It is a way to reduce and simplify disparate information into numbers that can be easily compared. This transformation allows people to quickly grasp, represent, and compare differences. One virtue of commensuration is that it offers standardized ways of constructing proxies for uncertain and elusive qualities. Commensuration is often so taken for granted that we forget the work it requires and the assumptions that surround its use. It seems natural that things have prices, temporality is standardized, and that social phenomena can be measured. Our theories presume that we can commensurate when choosing, that values can be expressed quantitatively. Commensuration changes the terms of what can be talked about, what we value, and how we treat what we value. It is symbolic, inherently interpretive, deeply political, and too important to be left implicit in sociological work. And then the authors give us two really interesting examples. First, faculty at well-regarded liberal arts colleges, at a well-regarded liberal arts college, recently received generous raises. Some concerned about the disparity between their comfortable salaries and those of the college's arguably underpaid staff, is Lucas, okay, offered, offered to share their raises with staff members. Their offers were rejected by administrators who explained that the raises the faculty received were not about them. Why? <laughs> faculty salaries are one criterion magazines use to rank colleges. Administrators, mindful of how fateful these rankings are, wish to protect their favorable ranking with preemptive faculty raises. Partly because college raters pay closest attention to professors' incomes, faculty and staff compensation plans are not considered comparable. Second example. Several working mothers recently described their strategy for managing their anxiety about the amount of time they spend away from their young children. Each week, they calculate a ratio of mom to caregiver hours. If the ratio is close or favors mom, they feel better. One woman admitted to fudging her numbers to produce a guilt ameliorating figure. <laughs> An opposite appeasement strategy involves the invention of quality time, when harried parents try to convince themselves that what matters most is richness rather than volume of time spent with their children. The emergence of quality time as a way to mark the specialness of parental involvement corresponded to the, rich, uh, to the large influx of mothers moving into the paid workforce. But some mothers embrace traditional values or those who sacrifice careers and income to stay home with their children sniff at the self-serving aroma of quality time, say researchers. So given all the talk about numbers of occupied seats in our classrooms, the supposedly disproportionate number of humanities faculty on our faculty rosters vis-a-vis -vis the number of students who take our classes, and this metric ignores the relatively low salaries we enjoy, at least for now, it's only a matter of time, how do we assign literature any quantifiable measure of value? Is the impossibility of doing so simply because we lack the will to do so? Or is it because literature itself always slips out of any plan to measure it for whatever purposes? To answer this question, a good place to start might be literature itself. How do literary texts rehearse this notion of inexactitude, approximation, incommensurability? So today, um, I'm gonna be talking about two different notions of inexactitude and the value of literature, and then the Q&A, we can talk about whether they can talk to each other. They might be quite different. One is um, this notion of comparison. You know, how can we have a constant unit that compares across? How do literary texts match up or not? Uh, the second example has to do with literary art as something to be exchanged. Here the question of value represents, uh, is the most represented. What can literature be traded for? Another way of asking the same question is what's its value? In both cases, the same problem of incommensurability and unquantifiability comes forward. And so I'm gonna be using two uh, texts for this. One is uh, Emile Habibi's The Secret Life of Said, The Ill-Fated Pesopotamist. And the second one is Kazuo Ishiguro's Never Let Me Go. So part one complet. Face it, we in fact thrive on inexactitude, not entire mismatches, but close enoughs. How to measure that margin, and most important, how to take responsibility for that management. 
So this is a quote from um, Adichie's Half of a Yellow Sun. After he writes this, he mentions the German women who fled Hamburg with the charred bodies of children stuffed in suitcases, the Rwandan women who pocketed tiny parts of their mall to babies. But he's careful not to draw parallels. It is this, this discretion that Adichie, in her magisterial narrative of the Biafran War, appends to her character's care not to draw parallels. This quick citation from Adichie does not do justice to the problematic she outlines in the course of some 541 pages. For this is not a matter of a failure of method, it's a matter of ethics, positionality, and historical responsibility. For the character in question, an Igbo-speaking white male journalist is in, is in an untenable speaking position. His discretion is as much a product of his inexact knowledge of Hamburg and Rwanda as it is his very real sympathy for and quite immediate knowledges, knowledge of the cases of genocide and grief that he sees in Nigeria right before his eyes. Adichie makes it clear as she graphically describes Richard feeling the blood of his victims, of the victims of genocide splatter against his clothes and dampen his white skin. Richard's care not to draw parallels, to make anything other than the slightest hints of comparison, prompt us to precisely seek out and test those parallels. Equally important, however, it also draws our focus back, not only to the character, but also upon the novelist who writes the descriptions of his thoughts, his non-action. Thus, in this slight passage from this huge novel, we find encapsulated the problem of comparative literature in any discussion of method. Our field commits us to embrace the world via faith in some underlying latent method that will come about to yield some congruity. But it's a hard thing to conceive of a method that respects the specificity of the object of study, that recognizes it via our imperfect imaginations, and at the same time compels us out of too tight a sense of discretion. So how can we proceed nonetheless? And this is a quote uh, from an interview that Raymond Williams did with Edward Said. The analysis of history is not a subject separate from history, but the representations are part of the history, contribute to the history, are active elements in the way the history continues, in the way forces are distributed, in the way people perceive situations, both from inside their own pressing realities and from outside them. If we are saying this is a real method, then the empirical test that's being put to here is that comparable methods of analysis are being applied to situations very, part, very far apart in space that have many differences of texture and have many different consequences in the contemporary world. There's an obvious distance from what is happening in the English countryside or in the English inner cities and the chaos in Lebanon. Yet nevertheless, I think it is true that the method, the underlying method, found a congruity. Congruity in mathematics means having the same size or shape, but in common parlance, it means matching in some way or another. This doubleness, meaning both identical and nearly identical or partially identical, sets up the play that literary texts exploit. They tend to vacillate between claims to two meanings, assertions of one or another. While one could use this as a general statement about any act of comparison, the text I will first look at exploits this doubleness by using it to force the reader to consider the ways in which claims to equivalence or near equivalence demand to be read historically. So this is the first text. The strange occurrence concerning the disappearance of Said, father of ill fortune, the pest optimist. The title holds within itself the token of tragic and comic double playfulness that pervades the text. Said simply means happy or lucky. So how can that beget ill fortune that seeming logical contradiction is then emblematized in the term pass optimist. This in turn steers our eyes toward the future as well as to the past. The novel comprises the modern history of Palestine, the repeated catastrophes, the optimistic attempts at survival, and the utter pessimism about any political or military solution. To get at the problem of how to represent this devilness, Habibi creates a narrative that taps into both traditional Arabic narrative forms, and to Western ones as well, most conspicuously Voltaire's Candide. What happens then when the operation of Western rationalism is placed upon the situation in Palestine? I'm going to give you two examples of equivalence and mismeasurement 
one literary and the other one astronomical. And both are joined into this tragicomic project. First, the literary. Um, one chapter is, in fact, devoted entirely to the suggestion that the Pess optimist is modeled after Candide. At one point, Said begins to have contact with a spaceman who, who wonders about the similarities between Said's letters and Candide. Quote, Kaid, uh, Said, <laughs> Candide was, a was an optimist, but you're a Pess optimist. That fact, I responded, is a virtue that, above all others, distinguishes my people. But you, he criticized again, seem to be imitating Candide. Don't blame me for that. Blame our way of life that hasn't changed since Voltaire's day, except that El Dorado has now come to exist on this planet. Do you mind explaining that? And explain, indeed, I did, by establishing a full and accurate analogy between us and Candide, leaving out only those repetitive circumstances that had occurred year in and year out over the past quarter century. Finally, I observed, quote, did not Pangloss express consolation for the Abarian women who'd been raped and who had seen bellies ripped open, heads cut off, their castles demolished with the comment, but we've had our revenge for the Abars have done the very same thing to our neighboring barony which belonged to a Bulgarian lord. We ourselves, after all, sought consolation the same way 200 years later. That was September 1972 when our athletes were killed in Munich. Did our military aircraft not take revenge for us by murdering women and children, just beginning to enjoy the sport of life in refugee camps in Syria and Lebanon? Didn't this console us? In October the same year, our planes, having returned from bombing Syrian refugee camps, did not our very own Pangloss, the Minister of Education and Culture, meet with some of the widows of our athletes who had fallen victim and console them by saying that our aircraft had hit all the targets and done a magnificent job? So I'd like to bring this strange comparison between us and Candide to an end with one statement. Candide, my dear sir, used to say, all is well with the world. One must admit, however, that one might well groan a little at what goes on in this world of ours, both mentally and physically, but in my case, it wasn't possible for me to raise as much as a groan. Habibi does many things here. For the purposes of today's talk, I would just draw attention to the attempts to grasp the horrors outlined in each text as somehow equivalent or at least able to be spoken of together. If one accepts that possibility, then the critique Voltaire mounts in Candide might be useful for understanding the historical situation in Palestine. And yet Habibi's narrator both agrees and disagrees the situations on Congress in both the strict and non-mathematical ways the term congruent signifies it's in the toggling between equivalence and non-equivalence that the text calls on us to make a reasonable judgment. Nevertheless, it's undeniable that the sequence at the end is this. Candide's statement is meant to be groaned at, and yet for the Palestinians, in their case, not even a groan is possible. So I'll give you um, one more example, and this is the astronomy passage. Our accursed teacher once announced that while the sun's year actual length actual length is 365 days, 5 hours, 48 minutes, 46 seconds. Al-Batani calculated it to be 365 days, 5 hours, 46 months, uh, minutes, 32 seconds, a difference of 2 minutes and 4 seconds. The, the Arabs, that miserable teacher of ours, concluded always did things quicker then. They thought faster than the earth moved around the sun, whereas they have now surrendered their power of thought to others. I dreamed that history would remember me as it had our ancient astronomers. This dream of mine survived right up to the time they ambushed my father, made his soul rest in peace, and established the state of Israel. The same miserable man used to assure us that the Arabs were the first to use zero as we use it now. Then they divided one by zero and prov proved to us that outer space is limitless and that the universe in it, as Ibn Arabi wrote, swims in a shoreless sea in the jet black of eternity. So the Pess Optimist again falls between two inexact models. All attempts to use the literary narrative of Candide to shed light on, even give solace to the Palestinians, is futile. And here the myth of Arabic astronomical calculations giving the Arabs a slight edge when compared to Western calculations has no bearing in the present day. The only thing that holds out any possibility, again, is the slippage of language that blends together the pessimism of the novel and even an ironic attempt at optimism. 
So for the second uh, text I'm going to talk about, Never Let Me Go, do you, have you, do you know the, fill you in. Uh, it's narrated by a young woman who's graduated from a boarding school in England, and after about a page and a half, you realize that she and the children are actually clones that have been bred to har have their organs harvested gradually until they, d in the language of the text, complete. In other words, they die. Um, and when I was writing this, this is from my book, I was writing this and I thought, wow, this is a really horrible story and dark and depressing. And then I thought I'd be responsible and read some interviews with uh, Ishiguro. And he had, and it totally, this is what you hate, he had a totally different take on what he was doing. He said, no, it's a very optimistic novel. <laughs> he said, you know, when we would take our child and her perambulator around Hyde Park, it'd be amazing, all these adults that would just hover around her in this protective shell. And that's what art is all about. It's protecting you from the inevitability of death. So it's a very positive novel. Because what happens in the novel is that the children are encouraged to be art, artists, to you know, produce art. And um, they can either trade the art as, for tokens in the novel, or else their art sort of disappears and it's taken up by the, the principal and is put into circulation in some economy they don't know of. But the myth is that it's going to, uh, for those who win the highest prize, it will extend their lives by two months. So they're tacked into this, tracked into this, this project of, of redemption. The children of Halesom, that's the name of the place, give, but what they receive in return, and here's what I'm talking about commensurability and exchange, is an incommensurate, is, is, is incommensurate with their donation. At one point in the novel, one teacher finally breaks down and troubled by the veil of ignorance that seems never to lift for these children, tells them of their fate. If no one else will talk to you, he should continue, then I will. The problem, as I see it, is that you've been told and not told. You've been told, but none of you really understand. And I dare say some people are quite happy to leave it that way. But I'm not. You're going to have decent lives. If you're going to have decent lives, then you've got to know and know properly. None of you will go to America. None of you will be film stars. And none of you will be working in supermarkets, as I heard of some of you planning the other day. Your lives have been set for you. You'll become adults. Then before you're old, before you're even middle aged, you'll start to donate your vital organs. That's what each of you was created to do. You're not like the actors you watch on your videos. You're not even like me. You were brought into this world for a purpose and your futures, all of them, have been decided. So you're not gonna talk that way anymore. You'll be leaving Hailstrom before long and it's not so far off the day you'll be preparing for your first donations. The narrative momentum of this novel seems largely taken up by the question, how will these donors be redeemed? If not by something, then at least by some recognition of them as something less abject. Simply sacrificing for the real humans doesn't mean much, for the children have no choice. There's no, value, uh, there's no virtue attributed to them. They were bred to do this, and the educational system has simply reinforced this. I taught this in my education class last year. It was very depressing. Um, what's given in return? There are two answers. The children produce poems and artwork and can either sell them for tokens or have them taken by the headmistress, Madame. In the first instance, tokens can then be traded for other items. This has immediate but no long-term benefit. But if one's work is appropriated by Madame, it bestows great honor and nothing at the same time, for it is a mystery what happens to those works once they are appropriated. This leads to what's called the tokens controversy. <laughs> the tokens controversy was, I suppose, all part of our getting more acquisitive as we grew older. For years, I think I've said already, we thought that having work chosen for the billiards room, billiards room never mind taken away by Madame, was a huge triumph. But by the time we were 10, we grew more ambivalent about it. The exchanges with their system of tokens as currency had given us a keen eye for pr pricing up anything we produced. We'd become preoccupied with t-shirts, with decorating around our beds, with personalizing our desks, and of course we had our collections to think of. With this new acquisitiveness, rational economic behavior sets in, and the vague pride which was given in exchange for having Madame take away one's artwork no longer is salient. Quote, by the time we were 10, the whole notion that it was a great honor to have something taken by Madame collided with a feeling that we were losing our most marketable stuff. 
art then is stuffed to be converted to cash. When, is, when asked by the children what happens to these expropriated works, they are told by the teacher, it's for a good reason. Hence, reason or causality is not for them to know at this point in their lives. The conversion of art is to something else is mystified. This in itself may not appear significant, but coupled with all that we have discussed so far, it becomes clear that human effort, the expenditure of energy, the deployment of bodies and body parts, becomes transformed into an absented value that forms the lure of the text. Where does all this art go and for what? Until we can answer that, the system simply doesn't function. It's all we ha it always has a saporia and a calculated one of that. The saporia is founded on the notion again of a scheme of recognition and identification that's skewed, corrupted, mimetically false. Donors seem to be one thing, but they're not. And even though they give themselves entirely to others in the most sacrificial way possible, recognition of this breeds repulsion, not gratitude. A child can be good at poetry and even earn the deference of her peers, but they have no idea what poetry actually is. Art can be made and praised, and then the highest compliment turns out to be privation and expropriation. It's not just a faulty exchange system we're confronted with, but a flawed system of human recognition and reward. So what's it all worth? We seem to have come to an impasse. If we buy into the redemptive novel uh, narrative Ishigawa offers, that they are just like us, and that art and education are necessary to our relief from death, our enjoyment of life, and our ability to act well toward others, we are still nagged by the question, are they really like us? If we go to the second reading, that this narrative is inescapably linked to issues of contingency, slots of possibilities, historical materialism, and that those issues affect strongly how we relate to others and act toward them, we are forced to acknowledge the inexactness of this formula. They are alike and not alike us. And that, and that that reading goes exactly in the opposite direction that the author wants us to take. If we're not satisfied with his answer, that art cushions us against the horrible knowledge that our death is to come, then we either have to come up with something new or adapt his point of view to a new critical framework. And here um, I'll be concluding. My compromise, or perhaps evasive strategy, is to imagine that redemption nonetheless takes place, but only if we acquiesce to inexactness, incommensurate exchange, or near equivalence. In sum, there is a way that falseness is tied to misrecognition, and that in this instance, it's redemptive. If art cannot be exchanged for clear value, if it can't even be recognized as such, or name a fixed or certain thing, what good is it? The title, Never Let Me Go, comes from a song that the narrator hears and makes her own. She has no idea what the song is really about, or rather she doesn't care. Its mimetic qualities are absent to her, and what we find instead is pure affect, and most importantly, affect that is delivered via an imaginary narrative. So what was so special about this song? Well, the thing was, I didn't used to listen properly to the words. I just waited for that bit that went, baby, baby, never let me go. And what I'd imagined was that, uh, was a woman who'd been told she couldn't have babies, who'd really, really wanted them all her life. Then there's a sort of miracle and she has a baby and she holds this baby very close to her and walks around singing, baby, baby, never let me go. Because, partly because she's so happy, but also because she's so afraid something will happen, that the, the baby will get ill or be taken away from her. Even at that time, I realized this couldn't be right, that this interpretation didn't fit the rest of the lyrics. But that wasn't an issue for me. The song was about what I said, and I used to listen to it again and again on my own whenever I got the chance. So properly in this context means the whole song. The integrity of the whole is set against the favor of that fragment that is able to satisfy the narrative needs of the speaker. It serves as a prompt for her desired text. What she's made of it is a reflexive text, for of course she, a clone, can't have a baby. But that romantic notion that one is granted a kind of immortality through one's children takes another color here. For Kathy's entire existence is much more determinedly about passing on her life to others than even ordinary human beings, who may of course choose to or not to procreate. 
Her very coming into the world is occasioned by competition, by a competition of values and lives, a battle of death that requires death. The horrible irony is that, unlike a mother who might likely live to see her child born and grow up, Kathy's fate is to slowly give too much of herself to remain alive. So it's rather the reverse. Hers is not the voice of the mother asking that the child remain, but rather that of the child whose existence in this case will indeed be, to set, be set adrift, whose existence has always already had that fate inscribed on its body. Only an act of charity on the part of Madame and the society she inevitably represents, despite liberal intentions, can save Kathy. And, save Ka and to save Kathy would be to destroy the whole operative community of Hersham and the other institutions like it. Something always has to be sacrificed into the terrible logic of incommensurate exchange. But sometimes, rarely and preciously, this inexactness is a source of beauty and love. And this is what I'm going to leave you with. Kathy loses the tape that she loves so much. Like everything else in the novel, it's taken from her. Letting go is not the question, it's the impossibility of hanging on. Yet in this scene, which takes place a little over a quarter of the way through the novel, we find perhaps the finest redemptive moment. Kathy's friend Ruth has looked all over for the tape that Kathy has lost. She can't find it, but she gives Kathy another. Kathy, it's not your one, the one you lost. I tried to find it for you, but it's really gone. So Kathy accepts this substitute tape. I saw how Ruth wasn't to know that the music was quite unlike the song that, that I loved. How Ruth, who didn't know the first thing about music, this tape might easily make up for the thing I'd lost. And suddenly I felt the disappointment ebbing away and being replaced by a real happiness. We didn't do things like hug each other much at Hailsham, but I squeezed one of her hands in both of mine and I thanked her. She said, I found it at the last sale. I just thought it's the kind of thing you'd like. And I said, yes, it was exactly that kind of thing. I still have it now, and this is after Ruth has died. I still have it now. I don't play it much because the music has nothing to do with anything. It's an object like a brooch or a ring. And especially now that Ruth is gone, it's become one of my most precious possessions. So you can see the sort of doubleness between what the object was intended to be and what it is. The music is meaningless, the gesture is everything. The exchange is absolutely wrong and it's perfectly right. But the gesture itself then yields to something even larger. It is the trace of love and loss. Ruth is gone. Ishiguro's phrasing strikes me as a bit odd. It's characteristic of his prose to sometimes miss the usual locution by a hair and that simply calls attention to it. First of all, rather than refer to the tape as such, Kathy refers to it as the music, but it is music that is not listened to very much. It then becomes analogized as an object like a brooch or a ring, a silent mute thing, but one of greater value than a simple recording that wasn't the right music anyway. Its value resides doubly, in the gesture of pure giving without expectation of recompense, and in the fact of Ruth's ultimate sacrifice, her body for others. There is thus a chiasmatic movement of exchange of recognized value and at least the gesture of repayment that militates against the unredeemed sacrifice of Ruth to some anonymous beneficiaries. In conclusion, let me ask this. Can we rest well with this inexact exchange theory I've mounted? If this were one sort of world, or perhaps at certain times during the day or night, when we feel particularly optimistic or fatalistic, one might latch on to that. But there's a part of me that says that if art is to matter as something more than that, if we're not to set aside materially produced and enacted otherness quite so easily, and rather attend to and call out for criticism and remediation such violent acts of decidedly unsocial and indecent bioeconomics, then we should take our lesson from the other side of Ishiguro's novel and dwell not sentimentally, but with anger on the other side, and hope that we are not mere victims of bad timing, a slot of possibilities that does not include justice, or at least some recognition of it. In that weird way, we might actually see the Hailsham project was not entirely wrongheaded. They, after all, want to recognize the children as somehow human enough. It's that gap between human enough and human, 
haunted by an exactitude on each side that we do all in work and live with literature. At least that's how I think about it. Thank you. Zip. Thanks, David. That was, uh, I thought it was amazing. This, and it's an amazingly interesting philosophical problem, and, and at the same time, problem of our profession, humanities, you mm. brought up. And uh, I think what I have is more than a commentary, it's a real question, but at the same time, it's a commentary. Um, so I can take it either way, mm. because mm -hmm. I'm not completely sure. Mm -hmm where they understood with exactitude where you wanted to go. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that's on a criticism. It makes it more interesting, OK? I, mean, I don't know whether I can really formulate it because I feel it's complex and difficult. OK. So I mean, my question is, can we live in this profession of ours, mm. really, in a condition of inexactitude? And what I take from your, from your lecture, I mean, maybe in spite of yourself, Margaret, Margaret one is that the answer is no, um, mm. in the following sense. Uh, let's say, OK, we analyze text. In the olden days, you said you, you interpret text, you deal with text, you analyze text in the classroom. And it is very clear, and uh, it has been described as a triumph, that uh, there are no solutions, solutions with exactitude as we imagine, the humanists, that the sciences or math and so forth and so forth happen. And that's clear, and it has been celebrated as a triumph in the sense, oh, this produces this fantastic dispersion. It produces a multiplicity of results, and after each session you can go, everybody has his or her own opinion on the poem. Mm -hmm. That, I think, and we kind of all know that, even if we profess that this is what we want, this is unsatisfying, and it's also, I think, it's almost irresponsible in terms of I'm not making a joke for people who pay tuition, but you know, it's just, no, you, you don't leave the classroom. So my point is whether what you have been describing can go like this. Uh, there is an exactitude, but the first point is, I mean, you have to believe there is, A. And I think there's reason to believe that there is. B, and that's different from, from math, mm. uh, I'm using math metonymically, um, there is no promise that the solution will ever occur, nor does anybody know ahead of time mm -hmm. what the solution would be. But, and that's the decisive moment for me, there are moments when this happens, as I like the word so much, epiphanically, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, and when you are there, you know it happened in this very moment. And this, I think, that, that there, such a moment can mm -hmm. exist, and we all have been in such moments. Maybe these are moments when we do not exactly know who found the solution, but it happens. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think this is important for this profession to believe that this can happen. It doesn't happen in every seminar, maybe 10 years. In my case, it happens maybe every five years, if I'm lucky. In other cases, it mm -hmm. happens more mm -hmm. often. But, but it can yeah. happen. It's mm -hmm. important to believe that it can happen. It's important to admit uh, that there is no solution that you yeah. could yeah. Uh, tell before ahead of time. I mean. I could go on and on and on. My question is, A, uh, that I think it is interesting uh, that the concept of redemption that I like a whole lot uh, came up so central in your talk. Mm -hmm. Because of course, redemption, mm -hmm. as we use it in theology and in other contexts as a metaphor, goes back to a very uh, calibered, well calibered mm -hmm. economic mm -hmm. change. Mm -hmm. yeah, you can, I mean, redemption value of Coke bottle, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then secondly, uh, I think it is interesting that in the third critique in, in Kant, there is a passage that I think laterally describes this phenomenon when he says uh, it is typical uh, of the aesthetic judgment, and then he says, uh, dass man Konsens erheischt, that everybody believes that consensus is possible when mm -hmm. you have a good mm -hmm. solution, mm -hmm. although we empirically know right. that it hardly ever happens, or mm -hmm. maybe mm -hmm. it never happens. Mm -hmm. So this point. Yeah, that it yeah. can happen, that you have to believe that it can happen, uh, is, I take away from your lecture, yeah. Yeah. crucial in this ocean of inexactitude. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, the way I would respond to something you and I have talked about before, which is the whole idea of temporality. 
right? The, the way we assess things in the university is so geared toward, well, you're a senior now, so you must have you know, acquired everything you're going to acquire, yeah. right? And you can test for that, and you have that capacity. But you know, as well as I do, the best letters we get are from students five or six or eight or 10 years out, right? When life sort of catches up with them, and they have that epiphany, right? There's a set of circumstances that kick in, and we have done our job in that we've developed in them the sensitivity to be receptive to that. But I, that's the, one of the huge problems I have with assessment is that it's so, it, it's, it's, its sense of life is so truncated and so you know, quantifiably short that it doesn't allow for it precisely in exactitude because if you measure it at that point, then it looks really crappy, right? But if you just sort of leave it more open-ended, which is what hopefully our lives are like, unlike the poor kids at Hailsham, right? then there's that, that, there's that capacity. So that's why I would say that we have to be able to live with inexactitude if we accept a different temporality, right? We don't, if we don't calibrate our lives in exactly that way. Of course, our students, our undergraduates can't do that because they have to get jobs. I mean, they have, there's a sort of pace that they have to keep up. And so if they don't get it by the time they're clocking in 40, 68 hours. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It would be, be irresponsible to, yeah. That these judgments are ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. But we agree that there is this moment somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Catherine. Um, I, I was curious to hear about your response to the interview with Ishiguro because all mm -hmm. of my authors, of course, are long dead and most of them haven't bothered to comment on the works that they've yeah. created. So I'm wondering what you do with something like that. You, yeah. It sounds like you were not completely convinced by mm -hmm. his own mm -hmm. interpretation of his own works. And in fact, you, you, it sounds like you sort of grappled with that and tried it out, but that it ultimately doesn't work for your interpretation right. of the, the text. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's funny because we're in 369, we're talking about, you know, the, authorial intent, the intentional fallacy and all that, and here I am, you know. It, um, yeah, it was, it was it, you couldn't, I, once I opened that text, I couldn't ethically sweep it back under the carpet. Uh, and yet I was unsatisfied with it, and I thought, well, you know, he has, and then I thought about, well, you know, he has to sell books, <laughs> and you can't sell a depressing novel. And, and so, you know, I, I figured that I would accept it in the rhetorical situation in which it was given. And then, you know, my job as a responsible critic was to, you know, probe into that and say, well, yeah, it goes a certain distance. And then what I did was sort of ferret out, well, it would be okay if you looked at it this way rather than the way he was looking at it. So, um, again, it, it was kind of cheating, but I was really, you know, I'd written the chapter. So, you know, what are you going to do? I, I had to persist in some way or another. And I do kind of believe in, in what I said. But, yeah, it was... Yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's in this inexact thing. It's not something that, again, can be cashed in and redeemed in exactly the kind of uh, straightforward way that you would expect. Uh, but has, it's sort of devious, and you have to sort of go with that deviation to make good on that promise. And it's not entirely satisfactory either, because you know, the main thing is these kids die. I mean, you can't avoid that fact. And so how much benefit does this slight bit of redemption actually give us? Um, and I made a big deal of it, but you could certainly take it to be less, less impressive. Yeah. So I'd like to encourage uh, students in the yeah. to ask questions now and not save them for later, even though they could, right? But, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and I'll, I'll um, make one question having to do with historical materialism, which mm -hmm. you mentioned in the past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah. you know, what it took to be the ultimate equivalent of the ultimate unit, which was the man hour. So I was wondering if, if you could, you know, may, maybe just run with that <laughs> concept of mm -hmm. the man hour. Does, does it speak to our time? Is it, is it fitting in this context or not? Well, we're reading Donna Haraway next hour, so it's hard to, <laughs> you know, hard to nail it down that way. But yeah, I mean, the whole, uh, the, the, the idea of the man hour, the person hour, the hour of labor is completely, you know, up in the air now because of this idea of flexibility. The idea that you can, if, if select the unit, in, in our, in, at Stanford, right? If students go home, or if they're standing in line and thinking about our course, does that count as part of the unit? <laughs> Probably, but it wouldn't calibrate exactly otherwise. And then this notion of flexibility, you can't, you know, you can't not be flexible. If your employer says, we'd like you to be flexible, you can't say no. You know, you can't be pinned down to the 40 hour work week. You say, oh, of course, I'm flexible. Call me any place you want. You know, I'm wired every place. I mean, you've seen these hotels that have you know, wireless in the, in the toilet. I mean, it's this, you know, you're always exploitable, right? And you should, you know, like a good attorney, clock those in as clockable hours. 
right? So, but it is, I think the hour of, the idea of an hour is so flexible because it used to be, you know, Fordism. It used to be right there in the plant and you could clock in and clock out. It was very clear that there were limits, start and end. But now it's, it's yeah, I think it's, it's, it's very, very hard. And in Ishiguro's novel, we have that contrast between the leisurely pace of the mm -hmm. college, mm -hmm. right? Exactly, exactly, yeah. And what, what the value of that is. I mean, it might have more value because it is leisurely and more productive ultimately than very intense but not, not as productive work, so, yeah. And he talks, in terms of the contingency, he talks about this, the, the novel was first called The Student Story, and then Dolly the Sheep happened, and it sort of opened up a whole narrative possibility, which wasn't there originally, so. Very general question. Wouldn't you agree to say that the uh, next executive is a general condition of the whole world? In our mm -hmm. discipline, in the science as well. I mean, they give some room for mistakes, yeah. so they are aware that there is not exactly the same with, with cancers. Like the body, yeah. Yeah. The gender, it's only that executive mm -hmm. is only an artificial means to come terms with the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, it's, it's not that we can't compare, we do it all the time, but what I'm interested in is under what conditions do we make that claim of comparability, of, of commensurability, right? Something has to be erased from view in order for us to say that there's a clean fit or the clean mathematics. Uh, but yeah, of course, the world is mostly inexact, right? But it's exactly what uh, uh, the t sociologists say that I was citing, right? This creating commensurability is an act of erasing and, and smoothing out things in order to to create a kind of scheme that then attaches to value and compensation. Uh, and you can't do without it. I mean, you know, often people complain about standardized tests, but standardized tests, after all, were supposed to fight against elitism, right? It's supposed to be radically democratic. Of course, now we know it's radically undemocratic. But the ambition was that it would calibrate things in a very flat and even democratic way and break up inherited hierarchies. But it itself now, again, you know, the math isn't bad, it's about what the, the purpose is to behind and to which the math is put. Yeah. It seems very interesting that in, to some degree one is comparing things, mm -hmm. between one A and B, that's not taking about it and this comparison. Sure. That's made of this female and for this, although actually on both sides there's yeah. already something in it. Yeah, what could yeah exactly. Yeah. Well, this is where language is so interesting, you know, the idea of quality time versus Unqualified. What, what's the opposite of quality time? Dull, <laughs> stupid time, bad time. Yeah. So when you're comparing two things and you're comfortable living with an exactitude, how do you know when you're done? Like how do you <laughs> find? How do you reach an end point that isn't the arbitrary one of my deadline has arrived mm -hmm. and there's nothing more I can physically do? Yeah. Is there another marker? Well, the, the hope is that you're a part of. of you know, you're a social subject. You know, this is an intersubjective world and people that care would push back. But you're absolutely right. When whole groups become complacent and agree on certain things and accept that as the norm, I mean, that's exactly what um, S. Field and Stevens are talking about. You know, we've become habituated to these man hours or units or all that. It becomes a consensus and we're too lazy to press against it, right? So we know we're done when, when people start, when it becomes, you know, hegemonic. And we, we, we know it can be unsettled when you fight back against it and present an alternate point of view, yeah. But yeah, we, people, I mean, I'm so, we all reach, we all capitulate. I mean, we all have to catch the bus and get our jobs done. We, we do this all the time, we can't not. But I'm interested in, you know, what the bargain is that's struck when we do that and what the alternate possibilities might be and what we lose by doing that. Mm -hmm. For this talk? For this talk? Yeah. Well, because I'd written on Ishiguro and I was too lazy to uh, write a whole new talk. <laughs> and it seemed to fit in with what I wanted to say anyway. And the Habibi is just because I wanted to do some, a text that most people probably hadn't heard of. It's, a real, it's one of the most famous you know, works of Palestinian literature. Uh, and it's tremendously funny and sad at the same time. And he plays all the way through with, with Voltaire and a bunch of other things. Um, so I wanted to sort of bring that out so that people could see that. Because I thought they were doing similar things, but again, they're not exactly the same. Notions of you know, missing and, and, and near misses that are important and interesting in that way. Yeah. Uh, so um, you've talked about an exactitude in a way that relates to um, these questions of being a pessimist or optimist, mm -hmm. either way. So it has to do with these labels that mm -hmm. don't fully mm -hmm. apply mm -hmm. either. 
Um, and particularly with the horrible example of the mauled babies, this also mm -hmm. has a very ethical connotation. Mm -hmm. And I know that that's that human rights is a big part of your work. So could you talk a little bit about the ethics of inexactitude? Um, well, one, one um, strain of critique against human rights is that it's so dependent on narratives, right? giving voice and telling stories and telling stories under situations of tribunals. But it always, I mean, it sort of gets back to Lewis's question, it always settles, it comes to an end. Right? This is the closure of the, of this, of the tale. And then it always leaves uh, a neat story that then excludes other possibilities. And often when it's then uh, given the imprimatur of UN becomes the canonical text, the, the canonical story. So inexactitude would sort of pry open that space and I'm doing, as I say, mentioned in our class, I'm doing this article for a human rights volume that's arguing that social media is a very interesting kind of partial, disruptive, incomplete thing uh, that's horrible in all sorts of ways, but might also prize open different ways of, of testifying and then uh, creating exactly kind of contingent consensus that then is open to other things. So that's where I would say first inexactitude might come out because it's counterintuitive. You, you expect clarity, lucidity, exactitude for you to, in order to found a human rights action. And yet, as critics of human rights point out, that often then excludes other things. Gabrielle, you had it? Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if, if you really sustainably are mm. arguing for inexactitude, or are you arguing really for a kind of more exact exactitude, mm -hmm. a kind of utopian, mm -hmm. redemptive exactitude? I, I feel like mm -hmm. um, some of your, your kind of examples and responses mm -hmm. to questions come, mm -hmm. come to uh, a kind of point of, of admiring or arguing mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. a moment when things turn out to be equivalent mm -hmm. or enough equivalent. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. the cassette that does mm -hmm. compensate for the other cassette or mm -hmm. the, the evaluation of our undergraduates eight years out where they finally get what we mm -hmm. were saying okay. to them all along. Yeah. <laughs> um, or, or the kind of non-man hour based mm -hmm. understanding of our employment system. I mean, I'm wondering if in a way you you haven't totally heeded your father's advice. No, and you, well, no I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, and you do. I wouldn't put that on him. Uh, uh, there, there is a, no. kind of a, a, a fantasy of a utopian yeah. moment of sure. exactitude that is what we really yeah. do want. Yeah. Yes and no. I mean, we also have just done Derrida, so I'm full of deconstruction too. And I know that the minute I get settled in that and feel happy, and I do, then I have to take responsibility for that. I mean, what allows me to feel so happy and complacent at this moment? And, but, you know, I like to, you know, it is temporalized and I do like to live there longer than I like to live other places. So, yeah. Lucy and then Alvin. Yeah. I actually, I was thinking of maybe a different, it was related to Gabriella's question, but a little bit different. I, I, I was reminded while listening to your talk about it, of this um, workshop that Radilia gave maybe four or five years ago, mm. where she was talking about nuance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it struck me that one of the problems with the, the ways that exactitude is sometimes formulated is exactly that it is inexact. It's a good enough mm -hmm. set mm -hmm. of categories within which a lot of things get mis misrecognized or unrecognized, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. they, fall, they become invisible within their category. Um, or because they don't fit into yeah. the categories, yeah. Yeah. and so, and that's one of also the critiques of human rights is that you know it's 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 so category oriented, so and so norm so narratively normative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are all kinds of situations that right. are simply too complex, yeah. Yeah. And simply too nuanced, mm -hmm. and require a greater degree of exactitude yeah. than a narrative can contain. Yeah, and so it it almost is like this. Uh, it seems like both of the works that you're that you brought to our attention mm -hmm. had to do with this kind of possibility in literature to, mm -hmm. to get to a kind of subtlety yeah, yeah. and a, mm -hmm. a kind of particularity and a kind of complexity without, um, without bringing it to a close. Yeah, yeah. Again, I think you know, we have to look at the circumstances in which we work because human rights, I mean, there are political reasons why you have to, you know, have something happen. There are all these pressures that create the necessity to do something that you might really abhor, but 
it's better than not doing something else that you bore more. Whereas in the classroom, you know, we luxuriate in, in 10 weeks or whatever. Uh, but s still, you're right. Yes, of course. It, it, nuance is not something we're, we're happy with because then we get really bad evaluations. Uh, teacher didn't know what he actually wanted. You know, I mean, <laughs> you know, it, it, there's, there's no positive category for nuance. It would be great. I mean, I'm, it's too bad that Russell isn't here because, you know, he created the new eva teaching evaluation. That'd be great. You know, nuance, subtlety. Savoir faire, you know, this, it's, it's like, what did I learn to write? Did I, did I learn to think? Could I, could I drive a nail? Yes, no. I guess the hope would be that you, you have, you train some kind of nuance that takes place within that, that short synapse before you actually mm -hmm, have to act, mm -hmm, before yeah. you actually have to call yeah, the good yeah, 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 and hold it, you know, in res, in reserv, in, as a reservoir or something. Alvin, yeah. just, to, just to follow up on Lucy and Gabriella's comment um, or feeling, it did feel to me like mm -hmm. um, you were advocating as, as, a, as a mode of literary scholarship for precision about an exactitude. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that, that one, as a literary scholar, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's the way, sort of what you talked about, how to take responsibility of that management, mm -hmm. is one way uh, that we are trained to do and we hope our students and not mm. mm -hmm. to be precise mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. exactitude yeah. at certain moments, yeah. what its meanings, its epiphanies, mm -hmm. but it is some sort of precision, mm -hmm. some sort of mm -hmm. exactness that is there leading in front of the exactitude. But you would never let me operate on you, Alvin. Right? I mean, no, but I, I think, no, no, you wouldn't. I wouldn't want to do it. But no, I think I take your point that there's sloppy inexactitude, right? The kind that we, and then there's precise inexactitude, right? Okay, okay, Alex, that's good. And I loved your comment on the interviews. Um, mm. like, Todd never let me go in biotech yeah. courses, and then we go to the interviews. And I totally yeah. agree with you. What he says is a love story. I yeah. think it's about branding and selling yeah. copies. But yeah. he does say that he wonders, he sees the kinds of insights people have. Mm -hmm. the exactly. Years. Yeah. And so his experiment mm -hmm. was to see what happens when he forces mm. people to have that insight over 30 years. Yeah. So, so he's really trying. To, so he's actually trying to create an inexact mm -hmm. approximation of real life, mm -hmm. but being precise about it. So, mm -hmm. so, and so he does his body mm -hmm. and his insights okay. from that. Thing. So there's a way in which okay. you're I'm redeemed. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. Like, can, it, can it be an exactitude or, you know, take, take a broader statement like mm -hmm. there's, we know there's one literature, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. what characterizes it is, it, is, yeah. is what? Is yeah. it equalness, an exactitude? Yeah. Uh, well, politically, think, yeah. economically, yeah. socially? I think, you know, different texts lend themselves to different ways of being converted to units, right? I mean, some are conspicuously, you know, for the world and aiming for them, and others are intensely local. So, you know, I, th I would go with the evidence. And then sort of instead of 
fabricating a theory into which things then fit or didn't fit. Um, so that's, we could use a big scale. Take yeah, you could, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, some texts really do call for that kind of equipment, so to speak, and others are, are very intimate and very closed in, so yeah. Good. Um, let us thank our speaker. Thank you. Thank you for your question.